Well, good evening, Hickory Grove, and welcome back to the Pastor's Class. If tonight's your first night to join us, you ought to know that we're in the middle of a series going through the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, some of the earliest letters Paul wrote. Uh, you should know also that going along with this class, we have a couple resources that might help you as you join us in this study. On the one hand, we are basing most of this study off of a really nice, accessible commentary. It's a slim volume called Christ-Centered Exposition of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. This particular volume is authored by Mark Howell, and I'd encourage you to maybe go on Amazon or, and purchase that, and you can read along with us, and it'll help you in this study. Indeed, a lot of the content and some of the outlines are derived from that commentary, so we're really going to use that throughout the duration of this study. In addition to that, and if you don't want to purchase it, we're also publishing a PDF outline of every lesson that we do through this pastor's class. And so maybe you'd like to go find that and print that off at home and use that with you as you go through this study. You can find that on our website, and I think we'll even link to it on this live stream in the Facebook feed. So you can go find that link down there, click it, and you can use that on your study. Now, just a little bit of context as we move through 1 Thessalonians. Paul wrote this letter while on his second missionary journey. He had planted this church at Thessalonica, that's a city in modern-day Greece, and while planting it, he underwent pretty severe persecution, uh, so much so that he ended up getting driven out of town, and he had to leave Thessalonica and go south to the Greek city of Athens. And while at Athens, his heart being knit to these people in Thessalonica, his heart was so burdened that he wrote a letter back to these folks. And in this letter, we see Paul's unusual, passionate love for these dear saints. Paul demonstrates for us really a profound love for these folks. And today we're going to look at verses uh, 17 through 20 of chapter 2, and we'll look at the entirety of chapter 3. And the reason we're taking all that together is because these uh, roughly 20 verses or so, these verses really encapsulate for Paul his love for these people. In these verses, we're going to see Paul admire and demonstrate what a true church ought to look like. Paul is going to exemplify for you and for me how we must love one another. And so if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians and turn to chapter 2. And what we'll do is we'll read verses 17 through 20, and then I'll just pick up the first five verses of chapter 3. We'll pick up the remainder of chapter 3 as we go along in our lesson this evening. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, Paul writes, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person but not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? You are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, we sent him to establish and to exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, and just as it's come to pass, and just as you know. See, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. We'll pick up the rest of this in the next few moments. Would you join me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, now I ask that you would come and minister this word in a way that I cannot. Impress this word on these dear brothers and sisters as we are distanced in a way we are not used to. We do long for that day, Lord, when we will be able to regather, but until that time, thank you for this medium, this I mean, this is a blessing to be able to communicate God's Word freely and to be able to have an interchange without seeing one another face to face. And so use this, Lord. Use it in spite of me for the glory of your name and for the good of your people tuned in tonight. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What makes a great church? 
It's a good question to think about. What constitutes a really great church? Is it a large church? You know, Hickory Grove is a, it's a pretty large church. It's one of the largest in all of evangelicalism. There, most churches are drastically smaller. Is, is this what constitutes a, lar- a, a great church? Is a great church one that has great buildings, a lot of facility, a lot of square footage? Uh, what about a big budget? Does that constitute just a great, mighty church? Is a great church one that's influential? It's the one that's on the news a lot. It's the, it's the church that can really turn the heads of a lot of people. Is that what constitutes a great church? You see, what's interesting is as you read the New Testament, and in particular the Apostle Paul, you'll notice something. There's one thing again and again and again and again that constitutes, that marks, that typifies a great church in God's economy. And that simple secret recipe is this. It's love. Love is what constitutes a great church in God's eyes, indeed in Paul's eyes. It's a church that loves one another. But when you hear that, it should make you take a step back and recognize sometimes it's just tough to love the church. Sometimes the church can just be a frustrating enterprise. Perhaps you found yourself trying to get engaged in a local church. You're trying to love one another, but it's just frustrating because the closer you get to people, the more sinful you see them to be. Uh, the closer you bump shoulders with somebody else, the more friction and sparks start to happen. Church can be frustrating. Uh, maybe you have found church to be one of those things that just becomes, it, it feels futile at times. You know, you, you keep trying, but the more you try, the more you don't get some, uh, people aren't loving you back. You just find, man, is this really what God designed? Is this the bride of Christ? Is this what Christ intended for us? If you've been tempted, which I trust every person tuned in tonight to one degree or another at one time or another has been tempted to wonder, is the church worth loving? If that's you, I invite you to join me at sitting at the feet of the Apostle Paul. Tonight, let's listen and learn together. And by God's grace, as we hear from Paul, maybe you and I, by His grace, will grow in our conviction that God's people must love God's church. I want you to let that phrase just kind of go in one ear and out the other and then let it sit on your shoulders for a moment. God's people must love God's church. It's not a should, it's not a suggestion, God's people must. And I I would argue that this is the the main import of Paul's language in these verses that we've read and in the verses we'll read momentarily. Paul wants us to see and to feel that the church must be marked by love for one another. If love is lacking, you are going to see Satan at work. If love is absent, you are going to see a church crippled. A church can be massive in size, its bank account can be overflowing, this church can be busting at the seams, but if it lacks love, this church is weaker than the smallest church in the city. Oh, may God use tonight's message to shape my heart and yours as we behold from the Apostle Paul what it looks like for God's people to love God's church. And so as we see Paul express his love for this church he planted, I think what we can see tonight together is four marks, for lack of a better word, four marks of what it looks like to genuinely love God's church. Maybe tonight you're even, as you hear me, you're reflecting and thinking, well, I feel like I love the church. How do I know if I'm loving as Christ intended me to love this church? We're going to see this in the Apostle Paul, four little marks that could help us self-assess and say, Oh God, would you knit my heart to Hickory Grove as Paul's heart was knit to the church at Thessalonica. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to mark this down with me. Number one, one evidence, one mark of a genuine love for God's church is this. You and I, we must learn to love fellowshipping with one another. Now that doesn't sound altogether profound. But I want you to think about this with me. These quarantine conditions are unprecedented in our lifetime. 
I suspect that for most of us tuned in tonight, this is the longest we have ever gone without fellowshipping with a local church, unless you've had some sort of physical malady that's prevented you for a longer season than these last couple months. Now, in light of that, I want you to consider, have you missed the fellowship of believers? Now, I don't mean, you know, you know it's the right thing to say. Search inside your heart and now ask yourself, have you missed this or have you kind of enjoyed Sunday morning taking it easy? Have your, has your heart grieved not seeing fellow believers, whether in your Sunday school class or in the worship service? Or has it not been that big of a deal to you? I suspect there are some that have kind of waffled there and they know they should miss their folks more than they do. I am praying that God would do a work in my heart and yours and in this church that our hearts would be as the Apostle Paul's was and that we would love fellowshipping with the church. Look, if you will, at verse 17 of chapter 2. Just see Paul's love for fellowship with the church at Thessalonica. In verse 17, he was separated from them just like you and I are right now. And he says, we were torn away from you. That's kind of like what happened to us. We didn't willfully do this. We were torn apart over the last couple months. And he says, listen, we've been torn apart in person, but not in heart. Paul is recognizing that his heart is still with these people, though he is physically prevented from being around them. Notice what he says it more. He says, nevertheless, we've endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. And so tonight I want you to consider this. One mark of loving fellowship with other believers, with one another, is you and I, we must learn to fellowship eagerly, eagerly. Now, the reason that word eagerly is a good word for us to chew on is because oftentimes we fellowship out of habit or perhaps out of compulsion. How often do you find yourself eager for the fellowship of other believers? One simple way to self-assess this is to figure out your priorities. What are those things that transpire in your life that prevent you from fellowshipping in your local church? Does all it take is a late night on a Saturday night or a ball game, a tournament, or you name it. What's the excuse? We are all prone to wrestling with these. And Paul is saying, as a church, as believers, we must eagerly long for the fellowship of the saints. We must long for it with great desire. Oh, may God give each and every one of us an eager desire to fellowship with other believers. Closely related to that word eager is I want to also put this before your eyes. We should not just eagerly desire fellowship. We should also fellowship steadfastly, steadfastly, because notice what happened. Paul was not just choosing other priorities. Paul was actually hindered. Look, if you will, at verse 18. It says he wanted to come. There's that eager word. But guess what happened? It says Satan hindered him. Paul was actually hindered from coming. And contextually, that's because Paul was driven out by persecution. This mob drove him out of town. And of course, he saw that as the work of Satan, as indeed he should. And Paul recognized he could not physically come back into the city. Now, let's just go to a much, much lesser degree on those things that hinder you and I. There are many, many things that can hinder our fellowship, whether it be personal, meaning we just decide we don't want to because somebody's hurt our feelings, or it could be something that's a little bit more outside of our control, you know, whether it be a health ailment or something going on in your family that has prevented you from physically being in the house of God week by week. If that's you, I am inviting you, indeed I'm pleading with you, to pray and ask God to give you wisdom. The reason we desperately need wisdom here is we ought not take lightly not fellowshipping with the saints. It is in God's wisdom, His infinite wisdom, that He has designed the local church as messy and broken as it may be. He has designed this organization to come together and to build one another up. Is ought not be optional. Christ did not die for a church that you attend once in a while. He has called you to steadfastly and eagerly desire the fellowship of the saints. And so number one, again, mark this down, one mark or evidence of a church that loves one another is a church, is a you and a me that loves fellowshipping together.
But as we keep going, we're going to see a few other marks of a loving church. Number two, if you're taking notes, mark this down. A church not only should love fellowshipping together, a church really should love sacrificing together. Look, if you will, at chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, after he's been longing to come back to this church, he says, when we could bear it no longer, notice what Paul was willing to do. He says, on the one hand, he was willing to be left behind at Athens alone. Now, what's going on there? Paul's saying that he's going to be left at Athens alone because he is sending his partner back. He says, verse 2, we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, back to you. In other words, you, you may lose uh, the import here. It's important that you recognize that this was a pretty profound sacrifice for Paul. Paul loved this church so much that he was willing to sacrifice his right hand, his young protege, Timothy, for the sake of this church. Paul demonstrates for you and for me the inherent sacrifice that is necessary in any loving relationship. You know, it said, there is no love without sacrifice. You know this to be true in your own life, and just consider in the lives of the local church. If you sacrifice very little to be a part of this local body, if you're unwilling to give much, you typically find yourself coming to receive rather than to give, you ought to step back and ask yourself, in what way am I actually loving this body? Or am I coming expecting to merely be loved without any love in return? Paul demonstrates for you and for me at least two different ways we ought to sacrifice one for the other. On the one hand, we ought to be willing to sacrifice our plans for the sake of one another. Now, that's hard to do. Paul did this because his plan was to have Timothy with him in Athens. And Athens was a great city, as great as Thessalonica, and it was filled with gospel needs. He needed his right hand, and yet, the text makes clear, he was willing to part from Timothy. He sacrificed his plans to minister in that city with Timothy out of a love for the church at Thessalonica. So, consider in your own life. What plans are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ with which you fellowship? Do you ever find yourself willing to do this? Just consider by analogy your own marriage. Do you remember when you were dating, you were willing to lay anything on the line for the sake of a good date? You'd spend a lot of time preparing. You wanted to impress. You did what it took to make sure your spouse, your loved one, felt loved and cared for. But as is often the case in a great many marriages, familiarity, time starts to just kind of reduce that effort. And before you know it, now there's very little time spent sacrificing one for the other. No marriage that is void of sacrifice is healthy. A healthy marriage is one built and rooted on mutual sacrifice. How much more the body of Christ. If you are unwilling to lay aside your simple plans for the sake of your brothers and sisters, you are going to find yourself in a situation where you're not actually genuinely, sincerely loving one another. Indeed, in the most uncharitable sense, you might find yourself in a relationship where you're just using one another and not being willing to lay aside your own rights for the sake of the other. We must, brothers and sisters, I must, I'm preaching to myself here, we must love one another by sacrificing our plans. And closely related to that, we also must sacrifice, as Paul demonstrates, our comforts. The reason that word comfort is important is because when Paul lost Timothy and sent Timothy back to Athens, Paul's life got a lot tougher. It's not, it wasn't just a mere inconvenience. It's not like Paul just kind of lost something he would love to have. Paul's life actually got tougher now. There was more put on him at that point. So by analogy, let's consider our own lives and ministries within the context of Hickory Grove. Do you ever find yourself unwilling to open up, unwilling to be hospitable? unwilling to really do what it takes, unwilling to be inconvenienced. How often do I find myself battling this in my own heart? Let's just consider service within the body. Service, by definition, ought to be sacrificial. And a sacrificial service is something you wouldn't ordinarily be inclined to do. 
The healthiest churches I've ever known are those churches that are marked by sacrificial service. In other words, it's filled with believers who recognize not everybody wants to serve here and I'm serving there, not because I feel uniquely called, equipped, or gifted for it, but because I know there's a need and I want to love God's people by sacrificially serving here. Oh, may Hickory Grove be marked by men and women, countless men and women, indeed may all of our church be marked by folks who sacrificially serve one another, which means you sacrifice your plans and you sacrifice your comforts for the sake of loving one another. That's number two, may our church be marked by sacrificially loving one another. But number three, there's a third thing we'll notice, and this is getting us into that part where we haven't read it all quite yet. Number three, if you're taking notes, I want you to mark this down. We also must be marked by loving to suffer with one another, which I know is a strange statement. It's hard to say, Kyler, I know I probably should suffer with other believers. I should bear one another's burdens, but ought I love to do this? I want you to notice what Paul did in relation to the church at Thessalonica. Beginning in verse 2, and I want to read down all the way through verse 8. Beginning in verse 2, Paul says that he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica, and here's why he did it. He sent Timothy, verse 2 says, to establish and to exhort the Thessalonians in their faith so that none of them would be moved by afflictions. In other words, that church was dealing with some persecution. They were dealing with some real legitimate suffering. Now keep going with me. Paul says, For you yourselves know that we're destined for this. When we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were going to suffer this affliction, just as it's come to pass and just as you knew it would come to pass. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent, he sent Timothy, to learn about your faith, because Paul was afraid. He, he had some legitimate fear that somehow Satan the tempter had come and tempted this new infant church and that all of his labor in the city of Thessalonica would be in vain. But then Paul has some good news. Beginning in verse 6, he says, But Timothy's come to us from you, and he's brought us good news of your faith and your love. He's reported to us that you always remember us kindly, that you long to see us, and of course we long to see you, so for this reason, brothers, in all of our distress, in all of our affliction, we've been comforted about you through your faith. For in, now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. You see, notice what's going on here with the Apostle Paul. Paul recognized this, that a local church in general, when you're, when you're in these close quarters and you don't live life together, but you see yourselves once a week, you, it can end up breeding a lack of vulnerability. It's very easy for this to happen, where you can kind of come together and worship the same God, sing the same songs, sit under the same preaching, but not be terribly vulnerable with each other, not open up and demonstrate what you're really struggling through, what you're suffering with. And Paul, by example, demonstrates, he opens up, he's vulnerable to his church and says, listen, I want you to know what's been bothering me. I have been genuinely afraid. Now, the church could have been a little offended by this and thought, Paul, why would you think so little of us? You think we can't stand up under this? But Paul was honest, and he spoke to this church and said, Listen, I've been concerned about you. I am afraid that since I, the shepherd who planted this church, has left, that you guys would wither on the vine. But thanks be to God, Paul's fears were unfounded. He, find, he discovers through the testimony of Timothy that this church has not merely survived, it's thrived in Paul's absence. And so, just for us to chew on for a moment, a couple things that I think would be helpful for us to think through. On the one hand, when it comes to loving one another in the local church, by Paul's example, we must learn to strengthen one another. That's one way you and I can learn to love suffering together, is that our church would be marked by strengthening each other. Now, the reason this language is important is you'll notice Paul says, I sent Timothy to do simply this. I sent Timothy to establish you and to exhort you in the faith. To establish is to strengthen or to create a firm foundation. To exhort is to speak truth. So, for example, when you are interacting in your local church or even in your family with folks who are struggling, how do you respond? 
do you find yourself giving uh, a bunch of advice as if you're a counselor or you are, you know, you've got every uh, solution to every problem? Be careful, you'll find yourself very quickly becoming like Job's friends in the book of Job who gave a lot of advice that sounded really good and was not terribly helpful. Or you may find yourself more often than not giving a hug and then kind of commiserating. It's really easy to do that. Somebody's going through something, maybe they're having a relational issue, and you just find yourself wanting to affirm their frustrations and just kind of <laughs> commiserating with them, kind of just sowing further seeds of bitterness. It's so easy to do that. I stand before you as one of your ministers knowing how easy it is to do that. Paul demonstrates for us through the sending of Timothy that churches must be marked by strengthening one another. Now here's how you strengthen one another. You strengthen by not flattering them, by telling them what they want to hear. You strengthen by affirming them, telling them what they need to hear. In other words, you exhort and one of the best ways to exhort one another in suffering is to minister God's word to them, to remind them of God's loving grace, His sovereignty amidst all things, to, tr- to call them to place their faith, hope, and trust in God when they can't see two feet in front of them. One significant way to strengthen one another is brothers and sisters just to pray for them, to do as the Apostle Paul did, and we're going to get to this in a moment at the end of chapter 3, where he just cries out in prayer for these brothers and sisters. Oh, may our church be marked, number one, by strengthening those who are suffering. But closely related to the word strengthening, which we see Timothy do in particular, is we must also be marked by encouraging one another. Now, one way you encourage one another is that you come and you find ways to edify or build one another up. That means you look for ways to strengthen those who seem to just be a little weak. I'll tell you, one way that's actually unusually encouraging, which may seem counterintuitive to you, is to be vulnerable. In other words, when somebody is finally getting to the point where they are opening up about their suffering, it is very helpful for you to respond in kind and to help them know that you can weep with those who weep, that you can sympathize with the brokenhearted, that you indeed do not have a life that's completely put together. If there's one thing I've learned in all the years the Lord's afforded to me uh, to be a pastor is that every family has skeletons in their closet, that we all are battling certain secret frustrations. We all have suffering. It's a great common denominator. And one of the great blessings to the intimacy of local church fellowship is for a church to be marked by vulnerability, wherein you unburden your soul and say, brothers and sisters, I am nothing if it's not for the gospel. These are the things I'm battling. I am asking you to come alongside and strengthen and encourage me. And in response, I will do that for you. And we see that actually exemplified in 1 Thessalonians 3, because what happens is Paul is vulnerable He explains what he's struggling with, and guess what happens? They come back and they encourage Paul with a good report. And you see this healthy, symbiotic relationship where the church, with the church, is loving loving one another by encouraging and strengthening one to the other. Number three, we must learn to love suffering together, suffering with one another, bearing up one another's burdens, strengthening and encouraging one another. But there's one fourth and final, and I would say strongest, most profound way you and I can love one another. And it's the clearest in my judgment in all this text. Number four, if you're taking notes, mark this down. Number four, we must learn to love praying together. Love praying together. Look with me, if you will, at verse 9. In verse 9, Paul cries out, What thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So now may our God and our Father himself and our Lord Jesus, may he direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase in bound in love, for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus 
with all his saints. I want you to notice with me the kind of praying Paul does for this church. And I would encourage you to take verses 9 through 13 and write them on the tablet of your heart. Memorize them. Meditate on them. Use them to pray for your folks in your church. Pray for those in your Sunday school class, those whom you know. Pray that for your pastors. Would you join me in praying as Paul did? The first mark of Paul's loving prayer for one another is this. We must learn to pray gratefully. You notice Paul cries out with thanksgiving to God for these folks. How often do you find yourself thanking God for those people in your Sunday school class that are awfully different from you? You know, the beauty of the local church is it's a group that would be unlike any other social setting. In other words, you tend to, you tend to be drawn to those folks who are like you, similar likes, similar dislikes. But in a local church, it's just such a strange group of folks, all different walks of life, socioeconomic strata, different backgrounds, cultures. You find yourself, for example, in your Sunday school class, do you find yourself thanking God for those people that sit down the row from you that are really very unlike you? Somebody that you probably wouldn't ordinarily naturally be friends with if it weren't for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the local church at Hickory Grove? Would you Give yourself to thanking God specifically for those people. You know, you tend to gossip for those people you're not praying for, but you tend to never gossip about those people you're praying for. If you give yourself to praying for somebody, watch God do a work in your heart. You, you can't help but start to love them. If you pray for somebody daily, if you pray and thank God for somebody weekly, you are going to find yourself genuinely being thankful for those people. Pray gratefully and may God give you and me a heart as Paul's was that said, with thanksgiving, what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? That's the first mark of a loving prayer for one another. Also, we must pray, not just gratefully, we ought to pray persistently. Notice what Paul says next. He says in verse 10, I pray earnestly night and day. Paul is not doing just strange little prayers here and there. They're not perfunctory, in other words. Paul is praying daily for these believers. Do you pray daily for your spouse, for your children, for this church? I plead with you. I implore you, if you can do anything for this church, as one of your pastors, if you can do anything for the pastors of Hickory Grove, we would long chiefly and foremost that you would daily intercede for us, that you would be praying for us persistently, earnestly, day and night. Would you give yourself to daily praying? And watch, if you pray for your church daily, I challenge you to do this and watch God start to work in your heart and you're going to start overlooking a lot of those little minor things that we all are tempted to fixate on that make us question and scratch our heads about the local church. Pray persistently for the church and watch yourself fall in love with the church all over again. Pray gratefully, pray persistently, and may I finally implore you to pray purposefully. We see Paul in the final couple verses of chapter 13. He prays with great pointed purpose for these believers. In particular, we see Paul pray like this. On the one hand, Paul prays that this church, this church at Thessalonica, that it might grow in faith. Look at the latter half of verse 10. He says, after saying that he prayed day and night for them, in particular, it says he prayed that they may supply what is lacking in their faith. In other words, God, I am praying that whatever area of their faith is lacking, that you would supply it, that you would use me as a means to that end, that you would build up these believers. And he continues in verse 11. So may God, our Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ, may he direct our way to you. In other words, Paul is pleading, Oh God, would you help these believers grow in faith and direct us to them if we are going to be the tool in your hands. One way you can pray for me and you can pray for the believers in this church is, Oh God, may our church grow in its faith and would you use me in spite of me as a means to that end. 
When I interact with folks on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night, may I speak words of life and hope and not words of condemnation. May I be somebody that others long to engage with because I am an encourager. I am a prayer. Oh God, would you grow and strengthen the faith of our church? That's the first way you can purposefully pray. A uh, second way you can purposely pray, and we see this next, is we ought to pray that our folks grow in love for one another. You see Paul say next in verse 12, he's saying, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. This summarizes the whole message. A healthy church, a great church, is a loving church. We must give ourselves to love one another. And so would you right now pray that my love for you would grow as I will in turn pray at the conclusion of this message that your love for this church and for me and for all of us might grow? Oh, may we abound as a church at Hickory Grove to love one another. And lastly, we see Paul reach this crescendo in chapter 3 by praying finally that we would grow not just in faith, that we would grow not just in love, but that you and I would grow in holiness. For all these are wonderful things, but if we are not seeking the Lord's face and desiring to be conformed into the image of His Son, it's all for naught. A love for one another that is devoid of gospel truth, a love for one another that does not include sanctifying work in our heart, is not love. It's a facade. And so we see finally in verse 13, may He establish our hearts blameless in holiness before God our Father. Oh, would Christ do a work in this church that we would continue to be sanctified, grow into the image of His Son, and one of the chief evidences of this holiness may be a strength in faith and a love for one another. Brothers and sisters, if there is an enemy tempting you to believe and think that you can walk with the Lord without the fellowship of the local church, may I implore you finally yet again, sit with me at the feet of the Apostle Paul. Listen and learn and watch that in God's great wisdom, you and I, we've just got to love the church for Christ died for this church. Would you join me as we pray to that end? And let's ask God to help us do the impossible, to love as He loved one to the other. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask now that you would do that work in my heart and in all who are watching. May we learn to love as you loved. May we see with clear eyes the love the Apostle Paul had for the church at Thessalonica. And may we be marked as a church that genuinely loves one another, one that loves fellowship. Oh God, would you make us a church that loves sacrificing for one another. Father in heaven, would we be marked by, as a church that loves to suffer and bear one another's burdens together. And lastly, may we be marked by loving to pray for one another. For the glory of your name, Lord, we ask this. And for the good of this church we love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.